G'day, Justin. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Things are going well over here. I'm currently in the Midwest of the United States, Wisconsin, and just braving the winter here. We're slowly rolling out of it and getting into spring. So I'm getting excited for the upcoming storm chasing season here. Excellent. Excellent. Good to hear. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, where, where you got started in photography, where storm photography and that sort of passion came from in the beginning? Yeah, I'll try and minimize it a little bit because that's a pretty long story. But we uh, got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Justin Sneed. Uh, a lot of people know me as the Dreadlock Traveler. That was a moniker that came a couple of years ago because I got tired of my old Instagram name and it fit. <laughs> so I've been using that for, I don't know, the past four or five years now. Uh, storm chasing photographer. I primarily do my photography in the Midwest of the United States. Although sometimes you can also catch me in Arizona, Utah, New Mexico during the monsoon chasing season out yep. there. Uh, I originally started storm chasing in 2018 and I got into that in a weird way. A lot of people who are interested in storm, any kind of severe weather or things of that nature, they either saw a person who inspired them, so a previous storm chaser or somebody who's been in the game for forever, somebody like a Reed Timmer, for example, yep. uh, or they've also probably watched the Weather Channel and they just got inspired from it. For me personally, I grew up in South Carolina, so normally the weather events that I photograph, I, I never saw that growing up as a kid. Sure, sure. Tornadoes, supercells. In intense lightning, we, we just never got that in South Carolina really at all. I was doing a travel contract in Minnesota and I happened to be traveling to that, traveling to the facility that I was working at and I saw this strange cloud. <laughs> it's really low to the ground and it was, you could see it churning. What is going on with this cloud? So. Curiosity killed the cat, so to speak, and I pulled over. And luckily, I had my camera with me. And I just started taking pictures of this weird cloud in the sky that's churning, just looking just insane. It was the most insane thing I had ever seen in my life. And sure. after I started shooting for probably about three minutes, my phone went off with an alert, and it was a tornado warning. And that was my first tornado warning that I had ever been in. So at that point, I'm, the adrenaline's rushing. I don't know what to do, that type of deal. But even though the adrenaline was rushing, there was a there was a sense of calmness at the same time. And I knew that I was doing something that I should be doing. I didn't know what it was that I was doing necessarily, but I knew that whatever it was that I was shooting needed to stay in my life. So I just started posting cloud pictures. <laughs> like anytime I would see like some thunderstorms popping up type of deal, I'd go out and I would try to catch lightning and things of that nature. And I happened to get really lucky in that a previous coworker of mine has a boyfriend who at the time was in school for meteorology and was a storm chaser as well. Yeah. So she reached out and asked if I wanted to go storm chasing because she saw that I was interested in clouds. Of course, I was interested because I didn't know that storm chasing per se was a thing, right? Oh, yeah. I, didn't, I knew nothing of Reed Timmer or Weather Channel. Or, I didn't pay attention to any of this stuff. We ended up, I ended up driving from Minnesota to Kansas on a Friday night after work. Yep. <laughs> get in around two o'clock at night, and they tell me, "Oh yeah, we're going to Texas to go storm chase, and we got to be up in oh probably three hours." So I'm like what <laughs> like <laughs> at that time i didn't know that it was this involved so yeah we ended up waking up at five o'clock get on the road and we didn't score much that day to be honest all of the storms happened after sunset yep. and we ended up falling behind the storms anyway so it ended up being what we would call in the chase community a bust but that day set the stage for where i am today because I learned that storm chasing was a thing. There's a way that you can professionally do this. Yep. And 
I would have never known that beforehand. So I started doing my research, started learning how to read weather data. And, uh, luckily, Chris Jackson helped me learn how to read the basic model data and kind of mm -hmm. help pave my way into learning how to forecast for severe weather. Right now. So it's been so. a big experience ever since. Now I've been doing this for, this is year five. Uh, yep. 21 was my first full ledge storm chasing season and here I am. Fantastic. So in terms of the planning that you've got to go through, obviously there's a season, it, it's seasonal particularly for tornadoes down in that midwestern corridor from the southern parts of Canada all the way down to the Gulf in, in the U.S., Aside from knowing, okay, you're like more likely to get them in certain times of the year, what kind of planning do you actually go through? You talked a little bit about reading the weather data and, and so forth. How involved are you now five years down the track from where you started off that first time learning how to use that weather information? I'm very involved. <laughs> Short answer for that. Originally, when I first learned how to uh, start trying to look at the models and seeing where weather or severe weather was going to be. I relied heavily on the Storm Prediction Center. Um, yep. Those of you who don't know, that's a website that is used in the U.S. to they give outlines and guidance for the probabilities of severe weather in areas across the United States. Uh, so I relied heavily on that. But the thing with that is that they give a generalized area, outlined area of where they think severe weather will be, but you still need to learn how to forecast because that area could be 200 yeah. foot. Where is your storm starting at? Where do you see storms starting at? Where are they traveling to? How fast are they traveling? Mm -hmm. um, what, what direction are, your, are they traveling? <laughs> yes, what direction are they traveling? what hazards can be associated with this type of, with that day? Is there a higher probability for a tornado that day? Mm -hmm. Are these storms likely to produce significant hail and the tornado probabilities are a bit lower? So those type of things, you have to start learning how to analyze weather data. And I am still learning how to analyze weather data. The thing yeah. is, is that it's, it's something that you never stop learning no matter how far along you've gotten into chasing and learning how to forecast, regardless if you're an amateur like me or if you're a meteorologist, someone who has studied this field for years, you're yeah. constantly learning new things with weather. Regardless of what's forecast, you might get something completely different or it might do something completely unexpected. Yes, those are what we call mesoscale accidents and it happens a lot and uh, when those happen, you have to know what to do at that time yeah. because it catches you off guard all the times. And there, there are times when you have to make life and death decisions, literally, when those types of things happen and you have to end up in the way. Yeah. Well, I want to, want to talk to you. How do you keep yourself safe? What are the measures you take to make sure that you're not in the path of a Despite the fact that, yeah, you want to get in the path to, to one side of a tornado so you can get the shot, but how do you balance that getting the incredible image with keeping yourself safe and not dying, basically? Uh, a lot of that kind of comes with experience out in the field, I would say. So learning how to spot storm structure different parts of the storm, clue you into as to what's happening with the storm. When you have a tornado on the ground, knowing that if it's not moving left or right, there's a chance that it's moving towards you. That's yep. very important. And when you see a tornado on the ground, especially a photogenic one, you tend to lose track of what's actually going on because you're excited to get the shot. Those kind of things are very important. I would say, one of the things that I do to keep myself safe is I always plan multiple escape routes yep. so that if for some reason I end up in a dangerous spot, I know where I need to go without having to try and plan it at that moment. Yeah, That's very crucial. And I plan multiple ones because sometimes out in the Midwest, we have dirt roads that may have been there three years ago and they're mm -hmm. no longer in use. Yeah. All of a sudden, 
that property's been bought and it's private property and it's gated off. You can't get through that area. I always have multiple escape routes in case that happens. Um, yeah. Another thing that's been ingrained in me is that I work as a travel surgical tech and a travel okay. LPN. And working in surgery has actually taught me how to remain calm under stress, which is very vital when it comes to chasing storms. Because if you get into a highly stressful situation, some people aren't aware enough to step back and try to remain calm and make a sound and rash decision that could, again, be a life or death decision. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those things are very important out on the out on the storm chasing field, so to speak. So, in terms of making sure that you've also got the right equipment, what what equipment do you need to do it safely? Obviously, your camera and whatever it is that you want to take the image with is going to be all important. What other gear are you carrying with you that it could be safety related, might be photography related, that's probably a bit different to everyone else? Yeah. So in terms of trying to stay safe with just solely storm chasing, it depends on how much you would like to dive into. It. There's an app called Radar Scope that a lot of us chasers use that is on your phone. It's a mobile app. You can download it and you have real time radar data and you can pretty much chase off with that if you know what you're doing uh with that being said i have a laptop set up in my car uh i have a map software that i use for my gps satellite tracking uh situation with that so that way i can plan my routes where i want to go in a relatively decent manner instead of using my phone to try and plan it uh, there's also uh, radar software that I use on my laptop as well. Uh, that's a little bit better. It's nice to have a bigger screen and be able to use it. And then you can add inlays of different variety for for different weather specs into it. For example, mesonets, which yep. are vital with telling you what's going on in certain areas as far as temperatures and dew points, wind directions, wind speeds, things of that nature. That's pretty much the extent of what I use as far as actually chasing storms. Yeah. I also have a first aid kit. So just in case something happens, then I can be able to jump in and try to help somebody out. Sure. So what is it that makes you want to do this? What is it that actually grabbed your attention in the first place? Is it just the forms and structures that you're seeing in the sky? Is it the colours? Is it the feeling, the rush, the adrenaline that you get out of the, the risk? What or a combination, all of the above. Yeah. I would like to say it's a combination, but truthfully, I think I still process <laughs> what it is that makes me do this because it's just a feeling inside. That's yeah. the best way that I can describe it. I there are no words to really describe the drive behind it. There have been external factors that have helped to push that drive. Sure, sure. But the drive just literally started when I saw that random cloud and there was a part of me that just knew, hey, let's be doing this. Yeah. It <laughs> that was, yeah, that was the, the the drive. That's all the drive that I've needed so far. Yeah. Um, again, there have been some external factors that have helped to push that drive into overdrive, so to speak. But as far as in the beginning, that was it. And then I managed to find a way to put my emotions into the work, which is basically therapy for me. Uh, yeah. yeah. I always say storm chasing itself is the art and photography is the byproduct. Of, so when I'm storm chasing, for me, it's literally art. And then there are moments where I don't have a paintbrush, but Mother Nature paints that moment for me. Sure. And then I can release my emotions into the edit post process and then release it out into the world. It's it's my therapy. Yeah, okay. So when when you're planning a, a shoot, are you thinking about what's on the ground in front of you, the foreground that you want to put that sky against, or are you concentrating more on just I'll be wherever the sky is and whatever's in front of me is in front of me. Are you trying to get a concept in your head around 
the type of shot beforehand or are you just taking it as it comes and being more spontaneous because the weather is the weather and you're just going to get what you're going to get? That's an interesting question. So when it comes to storm chasing, ultimately you get what you get because the storms dictate where we go. Sure. So in my head, I usually have a feeling of a photo that I would like to give off a desired emotion, <laughs> so to speak. Yep. And there are a couple of compositions that I usually have in the back of my mind, but normally for me, when I'm out storm chasing and I see beautiful structure about to happen, things of that nature, I kind of chase off a field. Sometimes I may stop and it may just be a brown dirt field and I'll just get a quick snap and then that's it. I won't stay in that field, unlike most people, because you get caught up in the, the moment and that's it. Then all of a sudden, all you've got is shots of a storm and a brown. No foreground. So normally I'll continue driving around. And when I find that foreground, it's like a it's like a click. It's, I know. Sure. This is it. It's just the foreground yeah. I want. This is going to give off that a desired effect and emotion that I want to portray in my work. So yeah. that's how I chase. Do you do much experimentation in the techniques that you're using or are you just using tried and true formula to say, all right, well, that's my exposure triangle. I know what my ISO has got to be in this light. I know what I've got to do shutter speed wise to get either the movement or the capture the, the image that I'm looking for. How much are you experimenting with what you're doing with the camera in the field before you actually get into that compositional mode usually i have a kind of like a preset storm setting that i do on my camera mm -hmm. um, to do iso 100 f11 shutter speed of 1 2 type of yep. deal and then yep. i'll adjust quickly from there because sometimes the moments that we are capturing are they're very fleeting moments so you need to just instinctively know what to do whether or not to increase or decrease your shutter speed as far as experimentation, honestly, I am, <laughs> it's funny to admit, but I am a lazy photographer. Uh, a lot of my images are single shots. I don't do any exposure blending with my yep. storm shots. They're just single shots. And when I go into post-processing, post-processing, excuse me, I usually take more, no more than 30 minutes to edit a photo. I feel okay. like if you need to take more than 20 or 30 minutes to edit a photo, then to me, you're forcing an emotion into it okay. and for my sake. Sure. And I don't like doing that. I'll usually, if I sense that a photo is going to take me a while to edit, I'll usually will not touch that photo. Okay. Wow. For a while, anyways. I'll come back to it maybe in a year. How do you, I guess, stay motivated to experiment with what you're doing or get into changing up what you're doing you say you use the presets and move around is it really just that spontaneous what you see and okay i need to adjust slightly or do you think about that a little bit more deeply and do it do a little bit more planning around it it's more so a spontaneous thing because i've been doing oh. it for for so long now you kind of able to do it by feel i'm able to do it by feel yes yeah. i can just sense when i need to decrease or increase my shutter speed and sure. basically go from there type of deal. I will say that with experimentation, even though with the camera, I do not do that as much. Last year, I started filming slow motion lightning, which has been pretty fun. This year, I've got a couple of 360 projects that I'm wanting to do, um, even a 180 project, but we'll see how that goes. So okay. it's going to depend on some brands and what we're doing with that kind of stuff. But I'm pretty excited to be doing that. Maybe yeah. I'm not a busy photographer after all. <laughs> I was going to ask, you talked a little bit about in, infusing that emotion into and, and not trying to force it, but how do you infuse your own sort of style and vision into your images? I, honestly, I would say a lot of that has been very emotionally driven. So when I look at my work and I compare myself to others, I know that I am nowhere near as good as a lot of the photographers out there. Yeah. But I know that what I am very good at is evoking an emotion within the person who is viewing my work. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll often tell people, I don't want somebody to tell me that my photo is beautiful or, oh, nice shot. I want somebody to tell me your shot made me feel something. Sure. Or when I look at your work, there is something that that goes on within me and I can't explain it. And to me, that's the most beautiful thing about photography because you can blend it with artistry mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're touching people's feelings. You're touching people's emotions. Maybe it brings them back to a certain memory that they have with their grandmother or grandfather out on the farm in the Midwest. Yep. Yep. Uh, maybe a certain trial and tribulation type of deal that they're going through in life they can feel that within the photo we have a shared bond almost because they can feel what i was going through when i edited and posted that photo i tend to look at things from a very artistic perspective mm -hmm. and it tends to conflict very much with traditional photography because anytime i enter into a traditional mm -hmm. photography contest i know i'm not going to win I know that my highlights are going to be blown out. My shadows are going to be too dark, oh, sure. things of that nature. But I don't care about those things. I'd rather post how I feel than to just post a technically sound photo. Yeah. Okay. Is that what you would define as success in your photography, that emotional connection with the viewer? I think so. But ultimately, I think for me, the successful the success part comes when I'm able to be out in nature and have a scene in front of me where I know that I'm able to release a certain feeling that I'm feeling or a certain memory that I've had that has brought me to this event and I'm able to let it go almost while I'm, ex while I'm experiencing this in real life severe weather event. So yeah. Yeah. I think for me, once... Once I've had that kind of success, everything else is a bonus. I don't necessarily look at <clears throat> the successes that I've had as success. So sure. I think sometimes that kind of irks friends because they're like, oh, you're so successful. Why don't you celebrate or do this or do that? And I'm, for me, it's, it's, it's another day in the life of yeah. Justin. I'll, I'll post about it. I might celebrate it for 10 or 15 minutes and then it's out of my head and I'm on to the next thing. Because, Moving on, got to get that next shot. Yeah. yeah, I just look at life as, you know, growing up where I grew up, there are so many people who they cannot even afford a camera that I have. Sure. It's a dollar camera. That's something that most people can't afford where I'm from. Yeah. So for me to be able to make it out of that circumstance and to be able to not only do what I do in the traveling field as a healthcare worker, but to also take half a year off to storm chase. Yeah. That's ultimate success right there. I, for me, there, there is nothing that's better than that because I've seen where I've came from. So yeah. yeah. Anything else that happens, it's just all bonus. I'm very appreciative of it, but I also understand that what I have right now is a beautiful thing and I need to cherish that type of deal. So yeah, I try not to let any success get to my head, so to speak. That's awesome. That's awesome. In terms of that lifestyle choice, you've got yourself in a position where you're able to take time off for extended periods to go out and chase. How did you arrive at that in terms of your work-life balance, your photography and work balance? How, how did you set that up or what what techniques did you use to set your your career up that way yeah, that's a very interesting question in 2018 when i first started storm chasing i i was not a financially sound person i'll put it to you that way i was a lot of people who live paycheck to paycheck i would take the money that i would have and i would go off to somewhere to do photography on a weekend every weekend i had to go somewhere different to shoot a waterfall or shoot a Milky Way scene, things of that nature. Yep. When I started storm chasing, I would do local events. So anything that was two to three hours away after I got off work, I would go chase and practice. And that was fine and dandy. 2020 came and obviously COVID hit that year. Yep. I was working in the same hospital that I am at right now. That year, I wasn't able to chase really. 
because of COVID. I ended up staying in the hospital a lot, things of that nature. And I think I might've gotten eight days of chasing it in 2020. Wow. And that affected me deeply. I was pretty depressed. I didn't want to take my camera out to shoot anything at that point because I, I missed the storm chasing. So that summer I decided, you know what? You're going to chase the whole storm season next year and you're going to get yourself financially stable you're going to do whatever it takes to become a full-time storm chaser. I set up a budget. I started paying off all of my debt. I limited myself to just $100 a week to buy gas, buy my food, yep. that deal. And like I said, just paying off my debt, paying off my debt. So I ate ramen noodles and <laughs> one, $1 McDonald's cheeseburgers, that type of yeah, deal. Do dollar coffees. Yeah. <laughs> Things of that nature. Yeah. yeah, I really dialed back what I was doing and became financially sound. And luckily, I was able to pay off the majority of my debt. Right now, I'm, the only debt I have is just a little bit left on my house and basically a car payment that I could pay off right now. But I've chosen to leave it on just for financial sense, that type of deal. But yeah, yeah I pretty much forced myself to do that because I knew that storm chasing needed to be in my life. Yeah, yeah. I did not want to have an excuse as to why I couldn't chase next year or the year after that or 10 years from now. Yeah. And that's how I came to where I'm at now was just utilizing self-control. Yeah. No, that's, and that's... really, very inspiring, mate. That's that's fantastic to hear. And I think great advice for young people. A lot of people talk about uh, the generations that are currently around wanting instant gratification, money's kind of no object, you put stuff on credit card and all the rest of that kind of thing. And to be able to just focus and say, this is what I want to do, this is how I want to structure my life, I need to take some cuts on some of the luxuries in life now because I'm going to get a, a bigger benefit down the track. A lot of people don't, just don't click to that lesson unless they're really driven. Yeah, it's funny you say that because building those kind of structures in your life early sets mm. the scene for later on. So absolutely, I, I still have that mentality. That's why I'm still working right now in Wisconsin. I don't have to, <laughs> but in my mind, it's every year I storm chase and then I go work and save up a little treasure chest so that I can storm chase the next year. Yeah. Even though I don't have to do that, I'm still in that mindset of you don't want to take the, you don't want to take your foot off the gas, so to speak. Yeah. Build up your retirement, build up things of that nature. Don't overspend. And then I can go out and enjoy the things that I truly enjoy. You don't have to sacrifice during the winter. Yeah, fantastic. Is there a ultimate plan to make it full time or is your plan to just, as you say, keep your foot on the gas and keep doing what you're doing? I think right now what I'm doing is pretty good. Uh, luckily with me, again, storm chasing for the most part has a centralized area of prime chasing, which is. Yeah, it's probably pretty... not much point doing it outside that prime period. You, you get the odd storm, but it won't be quite as spectacular. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I do love to Northern Lights chase as well. Okay. But yeah. really what I do is I set myself up in Northern states so that yeah. I have opportunities. So that's why I'm also in Wisconsin right yeah. now. Uh, last week with that G4 event, I got to witness it and have it overhead. Yeah. I was working somewhere where I would have enjoyed, like Arizona, for example, yeah. <laughs> where I could be in some 70, 80 degree weather. I wouldn't have been able to experience what I experienced. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about locations and why, where you really like shooting. What's your favorite place for storm chasing? You don't have to give me any secret roads or anything. No, no pinpoint <laughs> geotagging, please. <laughs> no geotagging. Ah, uh, that was a good question because I personally love the states of North Dakota and Montana. Okay. But there are not a lot of opportunities to chase up there usually. So I don't really get a chance to chase up there. Um, yeah. But if I could have every storm chase be up there, I just love those two states. I think it's just because of the way the prairie grass is. There's just miles and miles of prairie grass that yeah. Yeah. waves like an ocean. 
in the win. It's mm. so cool to see. Uh, outside of that, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, South Dakota, kind of those high, what we call high plains chasing areas are yeah. probably some of my favorites. It's a little bit more challenging, but very re rewarding. If you could retire at one of the places you've shot, where would it be? Ooh, I've always told myself I wanted to retire just north of Cheyenne, Wyoming, but experiencing winter in Wyoming is <laughs> not pretty faint of heart. And I don't, I don't think I want to do that when I'm over 60. Sure. So maybe a little bit further south, maybe somewhere in Colorado. Um, Won't say on the beach in Miami. Ah, as tempting as that sounds. <laughs> Maybe if I become a full-time lightning photographer, then I consider it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Have you got any well, – I... sorry, I'm going to ask that question again. What's the most notable experience you've had when you're out shooting? I've had a couple. I've had a couple. I would say last year on a very photogenic tornado in Crowell, Texas, was very notable for me because it was my – it was probably my first – Close range, very photogenic tornado. I've had a couple before them, but not super close range. And they were very, those tornadoes were very quick too. This one just seemed to, it just stood apart from the rest of those, the other tornadoes that I've captured. That, there's been a couple of very photogenic supercells that just transcended are not, I don't even want to say transcend, but they blew away the expectations of what I was hoping for in terms oh. of motions. Lubbock, the Lubbock, Texas Day in 2021, Bates, South Dakota. Those two supercells were very notable for me. Of course, the days where I've almost died, those are very notable. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, tell us about one of those. <laughs> so we've had a couple of close range tornado calls, but lightning actually is probably the scariest thing when it comes to storm chasing for me. Yeah. Last year and just outside of, I think it was Mission, South Dakota, I had a very photogenic boat that landed probably 50 yards out. Ouch. Scared the living daylights out of me. But to date, that is the most photogenic lightning boat that I've captured. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> because it literally just arced out of the storm and toward us and it happened so fast. We knew what happened, but we were just in shock because yeah. we weren't expecting it to happen at all. The lightning bolts that storm was putting off were like five miles away. And then all of a sudden there's one in front of our face. Uh, outside of that, close range lightning bolts in the Grand Canyon, which are also extremely dangerous and scary. Uh, mm. And then, like I've said, a couple of close range, uh, close calls with some tornadoes in different states. But Lightning has been the deadly ones almost. Where did you learn photography? Where did the, I, I guess, the techniques come from and the understanding of how to use the camera? Because we're not born with them in our hands. We've got to, we've got to learn how to do it. Was it self-teaching? Did you go through any formal education in school or anything? Self-teaching, for sure. So you, a couple of YouTube videos in terms of how to learn the basics of ISO, shutter speed, aperture, those things, and how they correspond with each other. That, and then in terms of editing, <clears throat> that was very self-taught. And I had a little bit of inspiration from two photographers who have very moody styles. And I feel as though I incorporated some of their the way that they can make a photo feel into mm -hmm. my work, but it still has my unique taste, I guess you could say for it sure uh, but yeah my friends uh matt blue jay and chris lynn they were definitely inspirations and in how i wanted to portray emotion within my work yeah you mentioned that you've got a couple of projects coming up how important is it for you to have a project in your sort of career is it something that you're always searching for and trying to implement a a portfolio or a body of work that you want to put together that expresses a particular emotion or a, is directed at a particular location or area or something like that. A lot of photographers set themselves up these goals. How important is, are those goals to you and that process of creating a project out of your work? 
I would say it's not as important as it probably would be for most people. Sure. But again, I think it comes from the fact that I already know that what I'm doing is just being able to do this is a success. So yeah. again, anything else is a bonus. I do love to, I am loving the fact that I'm branching myself out a little bit and doing something a little bit different, hmm. but I'm still going to be doing the same thing that I've always been doing with shooting uh, storms. I'll just be adding one or two little elements that I'll have to incorporate first and then get to my shooting type of deal. But yeah, I, I think that I, I don't, I'll put it to you this way. I don't need a project to feel like I'm doing something Sure. because I know that just being able to get out and shoot and again, connect with nature the way I want to is just the most rewarding thing that there yeah. is. And that's no enough. Kind of, yeah. yeah, that's enough. No kind of project or monetary income could replace that. And I'm willing to work and pay for it myself just to be able to do it. Yeah. So, and I'll look at it. Yeah, great. Do you print much of your work or is it all online? Uh, I print my work. I've got two big 24 by 36s right now at a friend's place that they're considering buying. Some people had already bought them. <laughs> so I had to use those for an interview I did a couple, couple of days ago. And they were like, oh, we think we might want these. I was like, take your time. But yes, I print my work in multiple places. I have my work online with NFTs, which I know are a hot button topic. Hey, it's another source of income that keeps me out storm chasing. Yep. It's a it's <laughs> another way of marketing marketing your work. It is. It's another way of marketing your work and connecting with people. Because again, though the, a lot of the people who have collected my work, they are like me. They've never seen these types of things. So their yeah. their curiosity gets peaked and then all of a sudden, they're tuning into a live stream. Yeah. They're yeah. just ex excited as everybody else type of deal. But the difference is that they're literally making a monetary impact on my journey because the money that they've spent on me helps me stay out on the planes chasing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have gas, maintenance, hotels, if we have to stay in a hotel. Yep. And those costs add up. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. budget is it's pretty wild with storm chasing. Yeah. The storm chasing community in the States is quite a an interesting beast in itself. Can you talk to me a little bit about being a part of that community? Do you feel like you're part of that community or do you feel separate to it? When it comes to the chasing community, I feel like I'm on the outer limits of it. Okay. And I say that because when I first got into storm chasing, I didn't know that there was a chase community really. Yeah. I had heard of there being a chase community, but I didn't know anybody. I have a few friends within the chase community who are near and dear, and I spend a lot of time with them. Yep. Uh, one of them I stay with in Lincoln when I'm out storm chasing. The other I stay with in Denver. Or there's actually a couple of them in the Denver area or in Colorado. But I don't know. I just started on, I started my photography journey on Instagram and just grew up from there and I still feel like I'm not known in the chase community, mm, which okay. is okay for me. I'm fine with that because I've been able to build my, I've been able to build on my own, if that makes yeah. sense. And I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of that. I didn't go a traditional way of making it in the storm chasing community. Yeah. Yeah. And I've still made it type of deal. Yeah. So yeah, that's how, I, I feel on that. If, whether or not I get known in the chase community, it is what it is. Again, sure, uh, sure. I just want people to enjoy my work and feel something. That's ultimately my goal is for you, the person that's viewing my work, to feel something, yeah. whether it's inspiration or connecting with an emotion. So that's a great attitude, I think. A lot of people will... You get extremes, obviously, people that are very reticent to share their work and they feel like they're not part of the community. And then there's others that, I guess, want to, they aspire to be become leading lights in their community and they push and push. And I, I think that measured attitude that you've got is a really refreshing and nice thing to hear. I think that, I think sometimes those extremes can just lead to 
mental health things going on because yeah, you're, pushing yourself, you're, you're pushing yourself so hard and you're, you sometimes you just get really hard on yourself mm. trying to become something instead of just letting it naturally happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just let it be and enjoy what you're doing. That's what I, I want to enjoy. It. I don't want it to become a job because once it becomes a job, then for yeah. me, all interest is going to be lost. I won't post another storm photo if it becomes a job. Yeah. That's the way yeah. I it. <laughs> no, that's great. Do you like photo? Do you like being out in the field with others or a bit of a loner? Do you just go out on your own and, and shoot? I do a bit of both, although even when I go out on my own, I always end up with a couple of my friends joining or being around type of deal. The thing is when it comes to storm chasing, it's a pretty small community. A lot of my friends, they'll usually be out and we'll usually end up talking to each other about the setup that day or if we're close to each other, we'll be like, oh, hey, we're like 10 miles down the road. We'll come sit in a sit on a rural dirt road and <laughs> be hot and sticky with you. That type of deal are, are a favorite of ours, which is in every almost every Midwestern state, there's a Casey's Pizza or Casey's wow. Gas Station, I should say. And they have Casey's Pizza and it is a fan favorite of Storm Chasers. Oftentimes we gather around Casey's uh, gas stations. <laughs> So you're bound to run into somebody. Yeah. You end up talking to people. And it's a good time when you're out. How do you push past creative blocks and some of the challenges that come up in your photography? And what do you do to stay inspired and engaged with what you're doing? I would say in terms of creative blocks, I just let nature take its course and let it just happen naturally. Yeah. Uh, last year I was in a block. It was because of external factors, but I all of a sudden found myself not wanting to chase the things on a, that I love. Setups that I normally would chase, I goes, eh, I make an excuse for it. Or if there was a Northern Lights opportunity, all of a sudden I wasn't as interested. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it was frustrating. As humans, sometimes we just have to let our emotions run their course and let life do what it needs to do in order yeah. to guide yeah. it to the right direction. So I really, I just let nature take its course and guide me to where I need it to be. Even earlier this year, just telling my friend Jen, something keeps telling me to not chase this year. Literally just, I don't know what it is. It was just something, a, a feeling, a, a gut check almost, like something's yeah. telling me not to chase. But I haven't felt that in the last month and a half. And that's again that's just life and nature taking its course it'll guide you to where you need to be if you just listen to yourself yeah so that's how great, i deal with it great advice great advice what do you see is the biggest challenge facing photography right now i would say the need to push content out on social media constantly i think that's yeah. the biggest challenge for photography and the reason why i say that is because Social media has been a great thing in that we're able to connect with people all around the world. And within an instant, there's no wait to do it. Mm. Kind of like how we're doing right now. Yep. <laughs> but on the con side, when it comes to actually creating, I feel as though a lot of creators are, they feel as though they're forced to constantly create so that they can grow their numbers. Yep. And the feeling of getting a large following and are getting a ton of likes and comments. It's great. It's a dopamine hit, a dopamine hit, and you want it more. You keep pushing yourself more and more, Definitely. but sometimes you lose a, you lose your core value as to why you're doing what you're doing because you get all of a sudden caught in the numbers or B, which I'm seeing from people who are not photographers who are enjoyers of photography and of yep. content. They're, they're being overstimulated. And mm. what I've been hearing from people lately is that there are only so many sunrises and sunsets that they can watch on an Instagram reel or a TikTok video. Sure. All of a sudden, they lose their luster. The emotional impact that they had before, it no longer hits because they've seen this a thousand times, 2,000 times. They've seen yep. a certain mountain range. It, thousand times two thousand times they've seen the desert southwest 
a thousand times, two thousand times. They've seen Iceland millions of times. Yeah. And I think we push so much to get our content out there that those who are just true supporters of photography, it's they're losing the emotional aspect of it. Yeah. And yeah. it's a bit of a concern when you hear people who are just supporters who are not creators say that. Mm. Because where do you go from there? Yeah, um, definitely. There's that saying, too much of a good thing is a bad thing, right? Definitely. And it's the same with social media. Um, I'm reading a book right now. I just got through uh, reading it. It's called Everything is Fucked. And yep. within it, have you read it? I have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you know that within it, it speaks about how as a society, yes, we've grown, we've just grown tremendously with technology. But because yeah. we grown so much we become comfortable with this with our lifestyles and you would think that with us being living the longest that we've ever lived having the technology to be extremely comfortable mm. you would think we would be extremely happy human beings but the opposite is happening absolutely in yeah. our lifetime right now while we're living it's People are more depressed than ever. People are stressed more than ever as far as studies go. And mm. it's going to be the same thing with social media eventually. Mm. People are going to start pushing it away because too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. What do you see as the future for photography then? That I do not know. I know for myself personally, I'm becoming a lot more interested in trying to do in real life exhibitions. Yep. Um, uh, being able to physically display my work, potentially be there and talk with people who are viewing it. Because I, I think that brings in an extra, just an extra level to how you're displaying your work and the emotions that can come from it. Yeah. Um, one thing when you see it on the screen now, but it's another thing when it's, in front of you, you can touch the frame of a picture and you can potentially talk to somebody face to face and they can see your excitement yep. and you can see their eyes glowing because they're like, I didn't know this was a thing. Tell me more that there's such a primal feeling with that. And it's so much better than just getting a nice photo comment on social media. Yeah, me. absolutely. So I'm really focusing on that as far as just photography in general i don't know with the enhancements of ai that's a big concern for photography obviously mm -hmm. yeah I, who knows i'm just here to enjoy the ride and shoot what i love fantastic all right what's your favorite thing about being a storm chasing photographer uh, i've never thought about this before <laughs> uh, favorite thing i think my favorite thing about being a storm chasing photographer is the fact that Growing up, I was scared of lightning. Anytime time there was a storm remotely close to the house, anytime I heard thunder, it's immediately I went into the house, I uh, unplugged all of the electronics, and I sat in my room <laughs> quiet. <laughs> I used to be deathly afraid of lightning. Just, oh, it was so bad. How the times have changed. I went from being afraid of it to standing out in fields with lightning striking all around me and being like, Oh, this is fine. No worries. Wow. What's your least favorite thing about being a storm chasing photographer? I would say my least favorite thing is that it's had a direct impact on the relationships that I've had that okay. were once built because with storm chasing, you have to be pretty spontaneous. I usually block off all from April until at least August. I usually block all of that time off and I make no plans with anybody yeah. because I want to devote my time to storm chasing. Well, obviously that's going to impact friends and uh, family members and relationships that I've had in the past. It's hard when a you're away for a few months, but especially given that I'm also a travel nurse, as far as like having a relationship with a significant other, it becomes extremely hard. Yeah. So that department is a bit lacking right now because yeah. in the past when I've had them and you know, all of a sudden they need me home and I'm not, it becomes a problem. Yeah, that's probably the one thing about storm chasing that is the hardest is not not having stability, I guess you can mm. say. 
what tips would you have for somebody that was just starting out and wanting to get into storm chasing? My number one tip would be focus on safety because when it comes to storm chasing, safety should be your utmost priority. Hmm. What does that entail? Again, learning how to spot structure within a storm because again, that those structures can give you clues as to what the storm is doing or mm. not. Outside of that, learning how to read weather data, that's a huge plus. Getting the experience out in the field with somebody who has already done storm chasing is pretty valuable because you just get to watch their routine and you get to learn what it's like to truly become a storm chaser. And it's not as easy as what people think it is. Uh, yeah. It, it's rather difficult. You drive a lot. You're on a lot of desolate roads for hours upon hours, and it gives you a lot of time to think about a lot of things. So be mentally prepared for that as well. Mm. It's very successful with forecasting. <clears throat> it's You have a lot of highs and a lot of lows because sometimes you score that grand setup, and it's the best feeling in the world. And other times, you miss. Yeah. And or getting something spectacular and you're 25, 30 miles away and you can't get to it. And you have to be able to handle that in a mature way. Are there any photographers out there you think I should be talking to on the podcast? Hey, yes, there are. I would say my friend Jen Walton is yep. a photographer who you would like to talk to, not only because she is a photographer, but she also started an initiative called Girls Who Chase. Who Chase. Yeah, I've seen, seen a bit of her work around. It's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would definitely recommend her. Uh, my friend Jim Tang, he's an excellent storm chaser. He's always hard on himself, but the guy scores bucket list shots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though he's hard on himself, he's gotten shots that a lot of storm chasers dream of and not many have been able to capture. He's got lightning at Monument Valley that I've been trying to capture for the past year, for example. Yeah, he's a great guy. Everybody loves him. I love to see you talk to him and see how pumped up you can get him. Yeah, <laughs> he's a little bit shy at first, but once you can break down that wall, you're, you're good to go. Fantastic. Thank you for that. I've got one more question for you, and for many people, it's the most important question that I ask. Do you like pineapple on pizza? Absolutely not. Did somebody tell you <laughs> that I <laughs> ate pineapple on pizza? I feel like this was a setup. No, no, it's a question I ask every guest. And I'm trying to find <laughs> out who the haters are and who the lovers are. <laughs> I am absolutely 1 million percent team no pineapple on pizza. <laughs> that is, I don't know how, who thought of putting pineapple on pizza? I don't that's know right. who thought of it, but it's, it's something some people are, are right into and other people, it, it's just, it's just completely wrong. <laughs> it is completely wrong. And like people that leave, leave, leave sauce in the fridge. For me, sauce, like your ketchup, that sort of thing, barbecue yeah. sauce, that goes in a larder. The If it's in a fridge, you put it on hot food, it's just too cold. <laughs> I can go eat away with it. Now, let me ask you this. Are you one to put ketchup on your steak? I prefer mustard and not American mustard. It's usually a, a French Dijon mustard or a, a seeded mustard. Interesting. On steak? On steak, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, that's a first for me. Okay. <laughs> I've never had anybody tell me that. I, I have had ketchup on steak. I'm not a big fan. It's okay. I'm not a big fan. Barbecue sauce on steak depends on how the steak's been cooked. Yeah. <laughs> if it's brisket, barbecue sauce is... <laughs> Ideal. <laughs> That's true. That is very true. <laughs> anyway, it's been absolutely wonderful spending a, a little bit of time getting to know you better, Justin, and finding about your food habits. Where can people find your work? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram as the Dread, mm -hmm. or you can find me on Twitter as Dreadlock Traveler. But the Traveler is T V L R because I had to abbreviate it thanks to. Twitter usernames not being able to be over 15 characters. So yeah, yeah. Those are the two main places you can find me. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. 
You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.